And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast. It's Monday afternoon, a wild, weird weekend in the NBA, full of playoff implications. We're going into the stretch run to help us break down the playoff races, a couple of Western Conference juggernauts, would-be juggernauts that are starting to you know, worry me a little bit, and then some other stuff. You see him in the athletic at Bleacher Report in his One Mo Thing video series, former video coordinator for the Clippers who will come up later in this podcast, Mo Dekeel, how are you? I'm doing great, Zach. How are you? I'm good. So here's what happened, among other things, over the weekend. <laughs> the much-awaited lakers warriors Oh my God, can one of us get up to eighth showdown occurred at crypto.com. The Warriors come up with a win in an absolute embarrassment and a debacle for the NBA when the shot clock stopped working and then it stopped working again. And then it kept not working. And then Lawrence Tanter, maybe the best PA announcer in all of sports, had to count down the shot clock like some dude emceeing a junior varsity high school game. And then they had a LeBron three wiped away, which actually looked like the right call to me. I like how LeBron just insists, despite copious video evidence, that on this shot and the one in Minnesota, his foot never touched the line. It's like, dude, what it's are they so showing you different video? Like, I don't I don't understand how you're so definitive about this, but the reviews took forever. It just took forever. It was completely embarrassing to the NBA, which should be embarrassed about a few things um, of recent uh, of recent note. And then the next day, Kyrie Irving, related, by the way, because this is a team that the Warriors and the Lakers, one of many teams that they are hoping, praying, would slump and let one of them at least escape the play in loser's bracket of death. Kyrie Irving, not only does he hit Frankly, one of the greatest shots I've ever seen, ever, mm -hmm. period. A running, lefty, like 17-foot semi-hook at the buzzer. Not only does he win a game, he wins a game against the Denver Nuggets, which when you start you know, parsing out likely wins and likely losses, even though the game's in Dallas, is not a likely win. And it no. turns in <laughs> to a win. And you add it all up, Mo. And they're both going to play tonight, the Lakers and the Warriors, so I'm not going to belabor it. Right now, basketball reference playoff odds, Lakers, 85% chance of ninth, 10th, or out. Warriors, 71% chance of ninth, 10th, or out. Playoffstatus.com, another site I like. I, very intuitive. People should use this site, playoffstatus.com. It's awesome. Both of them are about... 75% chance, ninth, 10th, or out. So that eighth hope, forget six, that eighth hope is fading. I'll never forget six. The West is so topsy-turvy and the Kings are so unreliable. I can't just forget six. <laughs> Kings are currently six, but forget six for now. Eighth is looking unlikely. And I mentioned the word out, Mo, because the Houston Rockets have won seven of eight to just sneak, 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 sneak up. On the Lakers, three out of the Lakers in the loser's bracket. They currently have the tiebreaker over the Lakers by virtue of conference records, just in case. They do not have the tiebreaker over the Warriors. They've lost that season series already, but they have one game left against the Warriors. They're playing good ball, and they're making these teams sweat now from both directions. So that's where we are. I don't want to belabor it, but what, if anything, other than Anthony Davis leaving the game because his he looked like a boxer who had lost a fight, that poor that poor guy with his eye closing shut, yeah. and he's questionable tonight against the Hawks. What else, if anything, of note, just headline most thoughts on Lakers-Warriors? Well, first, I was at the game with my fiance, and so the whole shot clock uh, debacle was kind of comical because we had a guy sitting behind us after the second attempt to restart go like, I'm just going to go to the restroom. They're not going to be done in time. Like he called it and then it came back and it still wasn't uh, ready to roll. And it is also important to note was there was a critical possession in that game. I think it was in the fourth quarter where the shot clock actually malfunctioned and nobody noticed and it reset. And the Warriors had like a 36 second possession. And and scored. And then, you know, the Lakers bench is going nuts. But that's 
the Bruins trouble with that. They yeah, noticed. They, they noticed for sure because they, they're they not used to having to play defense that so long. So I just want to be clear. It's you and your fiancé and Ben Affleck and J-Lo equivalent experiences at this game being discontented by the delays. Exactly the same. It was exactly the same. Both of us, you know, were had the same expression, both couples on our face. Um, the, the game itself was great. I just felt like the Lakers just couldn't keep up shooting wise. And once Curry got going and Clay had an unbelievable first half, and then Curry got going, and then you had Kaminga rolling, and then Draymond with just a vintage Draymond night, you know, I forget double double and assistant uh boards. Like, it was just impossible for the Lakers to kind of keep up, especially once AD went out. You know, one of the reasons I really like J.J. Redick on the broadcast is because he's lived this era of the NBA as a player, he has a very good sense of recent history. So you're at the game, you're not listening to the broadcast. Draymond hits two of those just patented Curry-Draymond pick and roll, trap Curry, slip pass to Draymond, lob to the baseline cutter. And is it the first one is to Kaminga for a dunk? Kaminga. That's my that, that, <laughs> every time I mention him, I say it like that because I've been on the Kaminga bandwagon for ages. And I'm watching the game from home thinking, man, I can close my eyes and see Andre Iguodala with that dunk, Kevon Looney with a much less vertical version of that <laughs> dunk, and on and on and on. It might be the defining play of the last 15 years in the NBA. And JJ on the broadcast, immediately starts talking the same thing about how that play, you close your eyes, you see so many different versions of it. Here we are in 2024, and we're seeing new versions of it with new guys. And you're right, they, the Lakers' defense couldn't keep up. I was just struck by, although the Lakers scored well and LeBron had 40, they just, it's so hit or miss with them possession by possession on offense. Some of their possessions are so stagnant. Nobody is moving at all while somebody just dribbles and dribbles do you notice that too yeah no it drives me nuts it's that and then it's the pace like i think this team plays better when they're attacking in early offense and getting going before a defense is set because then i think that's where they end up becoming stagnant because it's then just watching lebron then it's just watching uh russell with the ball in, in, in those instances and now you're just hoping that you're gonna you're playing against a sixth defender which is the shot clock now you're playing and you have a tough shot you know, the defense gets to kind of chill for a few minutes where nobody's cutting, no movement. And you think you'd get more movement from a guy like Rui Hachimura, even Reeves from time to time. Like, I get excited when they cut. This is a team that needs to be just constant movement in, in general. Well, and Reeves and Hachimura have stretches, particularly Austin Reeves, where he does this by screening for LeBron. And they activate their pick-and-roll game like that, and they activate rotations on defense to get the ball moving. And then, but but at at his core, Austin Reeves is a ball handler. At his core, Rui Hachimura wants to have the ball and go one on one in the post and and in isolation. At his core, Anthony Davis is a mix of a dive man who doesn't have enough spacing to be a great dive man right now, and someone who wants to go one on one in the post or face up. They just don't have anyone with off ball juice. D'Lo is like their best off-ball player, but that's purely because of his shooting. He's not moving right. around doing anything. And so when they when they are focused on, like, let's get our pick-and-roll game, our mismatch game, you know, the movie we've seen with LeBron against Curry specifically a hundred times, let me try to get him in a mismatch against me, or rotations, double switches, we start moving the ball around, they look good. When they don't do that, they look stagnant, and they just are getting nothing from the bench, and that's partly because Vanderbilt's hurt, Reddish missed the game, Vincent's missed essentially the whole season, Christian Woods hurt, just getting – Jackson A's actually had a good game, um, but they're just not getting much from the bench. Tough loss for the Lakers, nice win uh, for the Warriors, and uh, you just hope that Anthony Davis gets healthy soon because the Lakers' margin of error is shrinking, and AD has had a, a first or second team All-NBA level season any other takeaways from being there it's a good thing they didn't have any any like a giveaway item because it would have been <laughs> and here come the pretzels from the old <laughs> simpsons episode would have been one of those situations yeah no i i think the other takeaway was you know lebron was on another level and just nobody could rise up with him on that team like he really did try to put them on his back and get going and i think that was just a, a one of those things i it's fun watching him like i'm i'm gonna miss him when he retires in that sense and i don't know if we necessarily give him enough uh um love 
in, 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 in a way or appreciation in the way we should. But like, hopefully that'll come afterwards. But he's just, it's just impressive watching him and carrying that at this point, you know, dropping 40 in a game that felt like, especially in the first half, like a heavyweight match. Like I was uh, juiced. I was getting ready. I was like, this is going to be a great one. I'm ready. Oh, I was, I was psyched for the game. I couldn't wait to start it. And then, um, and then the finish was what it was, which is yeah. just like, you know, it's easy for me to say like, that just can't happen in a game of this magnitude. It can't happen. Like, happens like it happens the clock the hawks were the league leaders in clock malfunctions for years and years and years it happens i don't remember it happening in a lakers game i don't exactly know what happened i don't know if they ever explained it but like it's a tough look it's a tough look with the world watching the harder thing though i think that took the the wind out of the the arena was when they they took away the lebron three though we went it went to a review we're thinking it's a side out of bounds like whose ball is it coming out and then all of a sudden you know larry comes on the the speaker and just says uh got some bad news <laughs> you know that three is not going to count and you just you just hear everybody go what no it was then, pretty it was the stoppage was pretty quick after the shot right how many possessions like happened between the shot and the first because that's one where you got to get it right away or else it screws up the game yeah i i want to say it was lebron hits the shot warriors get a possession ball goes out of bounds and the lakers call for a review so there's a full stoppage and i think that's when it happened so i i think it was just one more possession but it went from a four point game to a seven point game and you're just you just hurt it just at that point you're just like wow i i immediately go like oh there might not be enough time now I don't even know how I feel about reviews. Like as they happen, I hate them. I hate them like anybody else hates them because I just want the game to go on. Like I want basketball to be a continuous game, which by the way is one of the reasons why fouls are down. I think yeah. it's it's not we're going to get into that later, but um I think the NBA does not want so many stoppages in the game. They they want to flow. And I hate the reviews. Some of them take so long that you're like, "What are you why is this taking four minutes? We all see the video. It's pretty obvious. If there's one dissenting voter in Secaucus, just throw that guy off the boat and move right. on with the game. But then I will, like everybody who hates reviews, including me, the minute you miss a massive call in a massive game, people are going to be like, well, that's inexcusable. That's a reviewable item. You didn't review it. You got it wrong. So I don't quite know how I feel. I just... I wish some of them were faster. There was a clock on them because like some of them just take. And if God forbid, there's like a shoving match and I've got to look back and review every player on each bench and every play. It's just takes forever. Yeah, I, I'm I'm anti review. I'm I'm perfection is the enemy of good. I think we're 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 striving for something that's it's there are still times where I don't even agree with the review. You know, and how did you call that and 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 whatnot and, and things like that. If we're going to have reviews, need to speed it up. I think you got to make it that they, they got to watch it in real time. Can't slow mo it. And they get just three watches at it. It has to be so obvious that after watching it a third time in real time, you see the mistake. And I like, like, I like that proposal. No slow mo. Like, yeah, I got to see it, how it happened. Well, if you frame by frame stuff and like some of these things are, are, are wildly close and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. I think down the, the, the phrase where I'm going to talk about how great it was, but the, the element of it is just like, we just got to live with it. There's going to be this stuff happens. I, I, I think we just have to accept it. Yeah. There's going to be a game if we don't have a review and I'm going to go completely ballistic. You can't call that foul or whatnot, or that's a terror. You didn't even touch him. Just got to move on from it. I just think it takes too long and the flow of the game is more important. You know, also something, there are a lot of people who feel this way, by the way, that we should just ditch the whole thing and just say it evens out over time. Now, over time may not be one game, but right. over and one game may be and end up being all that matters for the purposes of this discussion like you're talking about. But there are a lot of people who feel this way. Let's just go away from it. Human error is human error. As technology improves, things like goal tens will just be robot calls because the technology will be there to call them instantaneously. Probably foot on the line calls could be the same thing someday. I, I don't know. I'm just speculating on that. Um, and it's so it's sort of um, actually in a bizarre way bolsters your case that some of the most egregious missed calls are not reviewable. Like right. the one that comes right off the top of my head is the ref 
watching um was it Asar Thompson get tackled yes. out of bounds by the Knicks and not calling anything and the Pistons go on to lose the game. It's like, well, we can't review a non-call. It's like, if we can't review a non-call, do we need to review? I don't know. I'm getting yeah. off track. <laughs> Let's talk about the Mavs game because the Mavs are now 39 and 29 after a massive win in seventh, chasing that sixth seed as the Pelicans, who we are definitely going to talk about, uh, put some distance between themselves and six Sacramento Massive win for the Mavs. Again, it already happened. I don't want to talk too much about it, but that shot, I mean, that's as great. It, it's like, so I, I, I watched the Clippers game this morning because I wanted to see, like, how did they just get rolled at home by the Hawks? And the Clippers game was after the Mavericks game. And Jim Jackson, who I think does a great job on the Clippers broadcast, said, and and inadvertently followed the old Daryl Morey rule of cross cultural and cross racial player comparisons. That was one of his <laughs> old demands. Like you can't compare this guy because he looks like that guy to that guy. Said it reminded him of Larry Bird, and I thought that was a Larry made weird lefty, weird release point, weird angle shots like that. It's one of the greatest shots I've ever seen. I jumped out of my chair when it happened. It was it was actually so good that I called my fiance over to be like, no, no, you need to watch this. You need to see this game winner right here. Um, it was it's wild. And it was a nice little action that Jason Kidd set up coming out of the timeout, you know, and bringing Kyrie along the baseline. You get one switch, you get a second switch where you have him versus Jokic and Jokic did about as good a job as you can do defending that. I don't I'm not. I don't have any qualms with it defensively. That's just a hell of a shot. The running hook with the left, like clearly it's. It's just something where, like, did you practice that? Like, is that part of your warm-up routine? So I'm just going to throw hooks with my left here. Like, that is a wild, wild shot to hit, you know, for a game winner, let alone, like, just out of a timeout in general. Like, with the game on the line coming off full speed like that, like, it was an impressive play. Like, I was really kind of just I, I, in awe, really, of it. It was a hell of a shot. Now, as an 80s kid... The shot I immediately thought of is the junior hook shot from Magic yeah. in game four of the 1987 finals, which won the game for the Lakers. Uh, obviously, the stakes are not the same. The shots don't look the same because Magic is much taller and can have sort of a natural hook release, whereas Kyrie's just throwing it up there. Just an absolutely crazy shot. I do think it's interesting on the same day. I just I want your video coordinator coach. I want your opinion on this. On the same day, we have Jamal Murray with a, in a tie game. He released a go-ahead shot with the shot clock off. Denver can hold for the last shot. He releases his shot. five. I looked it up again today. 5.8 seconds on the clock, he's releasing the shot. So by the time the shot hits the rim, caroms off the rim, and goes, luckily for the Mavs, right to Tim Hardaway Jr. Hmm. Timeout. There's 2.8 on the clock. Kyrie then punishes them by winning the game. Same day, Cade Cunningham... In a tie game against the Miami Heat, who need every goddamn win they can get in the East. And the shot clock off after a Duncan Robinson turnover gives Detroit the ball back. Releases a three, a pull-up three, off the dribble, one-on-one -on -one over Caleb Martin, I think, well covered. Hawkes. Ha was was it Hawkes? Yeah. Um, with 10.9 seconds left. So five more seconds. Plenty of time for the Heat. Bam, bam, comes down. <laughs> and hits his fourth three of the season to win the game for the Heat. I just thought it was interesting. Two teams, same situation, two two guys shot early. What did you think of the respective shots? Start with Murray, because they're very different, obviously. D different shots. I said the moment Murray shot it and the, the Mavs got the ball, I said that's too much time. He left too much time on the clock. And it's very fitting with Patrick Mahomes sitting courtside uh, winning a uh, playoff game with I think it was 13 seconds left in a, in a game. Um, I think it's just along those lines of it, you have to make sure you get the last shot. Tied ball game, it does not matter. You, it, you're almost better off not taking a shot and just going into overtime. In that sense, if you control your destiny in that instance, you have to take the very last shot. Unless it's an absolutely give me wide open layup, the seas have parted for you and you can go, I'll take it. But if this is just anything where it's up in the air, you can't give that up. And I think that was a huge mistake from Murray. Like I expect him and and really the Denver Nuggets as a team, as as vets as they are, to know that and 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 nail that. I think 
Jokic came up a little bit too early to set the screen. I think they set the screen at about nine. You need to come up at about six, uh, five seconds, and then come off the action. I thought that was a a, a pretty uh, blatant mistake there from Murray. And I think, you know, if you're going to do that, you better make sure you make the shot. So the Cunningham shot with 10.9 left is just objectively horrible. Like, there's just no way around. It's a horrible shot. Kate Cunningham's had a nice last six weeks of the season. I don't mean to pick on him, but this is one of the reasons your team stinks is because you make bad young guy mistakes like this over and over. And, like, at a certain point, the bad young guy mistakes have to go away if you're ever not going to be a stinky team. Just an absolutely horrible shot. I don't know if people were yelling at him not to shoot it, if Monty Williams was yelling, last shot, last shot. Everyone needs to be on the same page in that situation. You got to let the you got to take the last shot. Yeah, I mean that that's the thing. You're screaming that from the bench, and they you better be. They slowed it down. Like he slowed it down. The 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 possession. It wasn't like a rushed possession, and then he pulled up. Slowed it down. Was dribbling out the clock, and then took that shot. I just I wish Monty was on was in the camera view because I want to see his expression. Sometimes Zach, when I watch these things, I go back and try to see the coaches' expressions because I think it's sometimes you get beautiful gems from coaches in terms of their their facial expressions. I would have just loved to have seen Monty's because I just think you got to just bend over, going like, "Oh man!" So the funniest thing would be if it were like the inverse of when Steph shoots a three and starts running it back on defense because he knows it's going in. If Monty Williams saw Cade Cunningham pull that three and just started walking to the locker room, like I don't, even, I don't even <laughs> want to see what's going to happen now. Like it's Cade Cunningham is a below average pull up three point shooter. It's not like he's Steph Curry where you're like, look, you've earned the right to just do whatever the hell you want, even though the clock management is dumb. Like, come on, the Murray one. So the coaching community and the anal- analytics community would, I think, almost universally agree with you that it's better to almost let the shot, the clock just expire than to shoot with 5.8 seconds left and risk leaving 2.8 on the clock for a guy like Kyrie Irving, one of the great closers, and the uh, teamed with one of the other great closers <laughs> right. of the last 10 years in Luka Doncic. Um, uh, so that's probably right. That's probably the right view. In real time, I must admit, the shot was such a clean look from such a sweet spot for him that I did not mind him saying, you know what? I'm making this shot. We're going for the lead, and we're going to trust our defense to hold for whether I make it and it's four seconds or I miss it and it's 2.8 seconds. And by the way, it might not be 2.8 seconds. It's one tip up and the clock is over. So that one, even in the light of day, I'm like, that was an open shot. Like Jokic got him open. It was clear. There was no help anywhere. I still kind of don't mind it. I am confident that I am analytically incorrect in not minding it and that you should hold for the last shot come hell or high water. And boy, did Kyrie uh, make him pay. There was one other play from that game that I know you were dying to talk about, so you take the floor. <laughs> There's a play where, first off, the passing in this game was we have Luka and, and Jokic in these games. It's You're just like, okay, there's going to be great passing. And, and I was going to send you even more clips, Zach, and I was like, ah, this is too much. Uh, but, you know, but there's a play. Luka's coming off of a screen. He's driving down, and he has Derek Jones Jr. in the, the strong side corner. And it just looks like Luka's dribbling. It looks like he's about to throw, throw up a shot and just throws the ball just straight over his head. Two hands just... Right over his head, perfect pass right to Derek. He, he he doesn't make the shot, but it was one of those things where, like, if he makes that shot, we're watching that play over and over again in terms of that. I mean, just the impressive level of passing that you get from these guys and in Jokic as well, like, when you don't expect there to be a pass. Like, it's you, you almost feel like it's a glitch in, in, in NBA 2K. Like, oh, that was supposed to be – that ball was supposed to go that way. But he took it there. It's just amazing in that sense. And their ability, both of those guys, to throw these kind of awkward-looking passes and deliver it perfectly, is it, every, it, it never gets tiring for me. A couple of quick math thoughts. Number one, it, was, it, it made me laugh, that pass, in real time. <laughs> Luka is the best overhead passer ever. It's a niche thing. I don't think anyone ever did it this often. It's like once every other game. And usually it's like from the basket directly out to the top of the arc. And you're like, that's not even physically possible for (laughs) someone who's not like plastic man or something elastic man to throw that pass. Um, Derek Jones jr. Had like four 
almost highlights in that game that weren't yes. quite highlights that would have brought the house down. And I, I want to shout out our colleague, Ryan Rucco, who I don't remember the call exactly word for word, but he nailed that Kyrie buzzer shot call because he was exuberant and enthusiastic, but in plain language without screaming and using words. And I don't remember exactly what he said that put the absurdity of the shot in proper context, his surprise at how it looked and that it went in and where it ranked in shots that he had seen was properly conveyed. It was a great call. The Mavs are really interesting. I also want to shout out David Thorpe, who we text now and then about basketball stuff. And after the trade deadline, he loved the trades that the Mavs made. Risk risk be damned. I was a little less enthusiastic about it because I think the risk of all those picks being out the window for so many years for like just okay guys in P.J. Washington. P.J. Washington is going to start making some threes at some point, by the way, for Dallas, and that will change the look and feel of their team. And Gafford, who initially was not playing much at all for Dallas to the point where people like me were asking, like, what? why did you even trade for this dude? Like, right. what? how can you give up a first-round pick? And David Thorpe said... To me, I think Gaffer's going to start. I, I just think they're going to supplant Lively, and he's going to start, and this trade is going to bear fruit. And it really has to the point that with a couple of exceptions here and there, a couple of game exceptions here or there, they've minimized the minutes they're playing Kleba at the five, as a stretch five. As you remember, that is the look that got them to the conference finals two years ago. That was like the pull Dwight Powell after five minutes. We're going five out the rest of the game. And they still have that in their back pocket and they still use it. But if they're not going to play Kleba at the five, they either have to not play him at all or play him at the four. And we saw him play at the four a lot against Denver and a lot in other recent games. He's not really making any shots this year and not really doing much of anything. Defensively, he's not the same guy, but they still trust him to be in the right spot at the right time and eventually hope he'll make some shots. They don't play Washington and him together much at the three and the four, which I think is interesting. This is my long way of saying when things get tight, I know Kyrie is going to be on the floor. I know Luke is going to be on the floor. And I know one of the rim running centers is likely to be on the floor. How they fill those other two spots is really interesting to me because you can tell they're not quite sure how to do it. And we don't, White have two guys that A, fit, and B, provide both enough shooting and enough defense that we think those lineups can sing. And so you keep seeing Kleba out there, and it's like, all right, maybe Hardaway and Washington, eh, that's defensively not good enough. Maybe Exum in Washington, well, is Dante going to shoot today, or is he going to pass up? But right. it's, it's just interesting to watch them solve this puzzle because as they showed in that game and have shown in other games, they're back on a strong stretch now. This is a very dangerous team. I know they're up and down. Their defense is average or worse, and it's got to be better. But in a series, one series, they're a very, very dangerous team. Any given series, and you want to say, well, except for Denver, they just beat Denver. Like yeah. I don't think they can win three playoff series. I think they're unlikely to win two just because of the consistency issues with their defense. But as long as they have these two dudes – and can figure out the puzzle pieces around it, they are dangerous enough to beat anyone. Yeah, and I mean, to go back to your Kleba at the four, you know, there was a lot of times where he would have Jokic in the post, and then you just have Gafford kind of floating at the rim, ready to come over. And they, they, of, went to that, they went to that scheme that a lot of teams use, and it worked It worked well for them, actually. Tell me it, more about what you saw there. I, I thought Gafford did a great job, because the danger thing about that is when you do that and Aaron Gordon's on the floor, you're getting that Jokic is going to shoot or throw a lob to to Gordon who's crashing in. I thought Gafford did a great job kind of cat and mousing it and and sort of like I'm coming I'm not coming. I'm coming I'm not coming. I'm I'm showing and retreating back and and whatnot and it's almost like a little bit of the uh the 2.9 dance to stay out of the illegal defense but it's more just kind of just making Jokic have to hesitate for a split second. I don't know if that's something you can do long term in a series, but I felt like that had a strong effect for them in this game, uh, and 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 really helped the Mavs defensively. I, it, nobody solves Jokic, but just kind of like just a fraction of a second slow him down and be able to give them enough time. And Kleba's strong enough that he's just not going to get completely run over 
right away. It'll be a few bumps and a few dribbles, and then Jokic will be at the rim. But there'll be some bumps, and I think that's kind of the important thing for them in this series. And now when you – or if they get to the series. And when you look at possible, like, closing matchups, I think this is going to be one of those things that's going to be just a carousel of those two spots. Who's going well that game? Who's playing well? What do we need? Do we need more offense? Do we need more defense? I think it's just going to be – there's – None of those guys are good enough to cement uh, uh, a spot of like, I'm definitely in the closing lineup. So we know they're closing three. I think after that, their next two is going to just have to be a a game by game uh, dependency and and decision by kid. And that's just tough to live on. Great stuff. Good, great point on that game and how they used that. They inverted the matchups. I mean, the Lakers are sort of most known for that, trying Hachimura on Jokic and having ad rove but you know the wolves do it with towns and gobert if towns gets healthy other teams have done it the most notable game it may be the one with the most long-term impact from the weekend was the new orleans pelicans going to three and one for the season against the clippers uh now the clippers were on the second half of back-to-back in this game on friday james harden did not play and they have been missing guys throughout this entire mini swoon that they're in however it was notable for two reasons. Number one, the Pelicans are now only one game back of the Clippers in the four or five bracket. And the Clippers, as much as they are just like, let's stay healthy, stay healthy, stay healthy, stay healthy, stay healthy, and may the chips fall where they may, would like to have home court for one playoff series. After running roughshod for two months in the league and proving yourself a contender and being number one in the West for 24 hours, you'd like to at least get home court. Number two... I think it's safe to say this is a problematic matchup for the Clippers. Now, that doesn't mean I would pick the Pelicans to win a series. I don't know who I would pick. But the very fact that I don't know who I would pick suggests that this is a problematic matchup. You know when it gets real problematic? When Zion decides, as he has not not just this game, but when they played in February on the 7th, I'm taking the Kawhi assignment. It would be very easy for the Clippers, between Herb Jones and Brandon Ingram, to split the Kawhi assignment between one of those guys and put Zion on Terrence man. And say you just hide out over here on their least threatening starter. Who's not Zubats. And that's what they did. The first two times they played since then Zion has said, I can do it. He, he said it again in the fourth quarter, Trey Murphy, the third mentioned this during his post game remarks. And I, I will continue to say the last six weeks that people are not paying attention. This is a new Zion on defense. He has never defended like this before both in team concept and rotation, and one-on-one, he hung with Kawhi. And as great as Herb Jones is, and as long as Brandon Ingram is, neither of those guys is quite strong enough for Kawhi over 48 minutes. I think it's a big deal to the Pelicans internally, to Zion, and to the Clippers, that he's decided for at least stretches, I can handle this assignment, because the Clippers have no one to guard him other than Kawhi which means Kawhi's taking a pounding on that end. Or when Larry Nance is in, they like to invert the matchups and put Zubats on Zion and hide, not hide, but put a wing on Nance. It's a little dangerous to do that against Valanchunas, but Zion likes the Zubats assignment. Look, again, Harden was out back to back. The Clippers are 8-10 and 10 in their last 18 games. Their defense in that stretch ranks 28th in the league. Now, you can sit here, Mo, and I will do it. Harden has missed two games. Paul George has missed three of those 18 games. Norman Powell has missed two, including they're getting shellacked at home by the Hawks yesterday in a just totally demoralizing loss where the Hawks ran and leaked out and ran and leaked out again and again and again over maybe the worst transition defense team in the league. Now that Milwaukee is not the worst transition defense team in the league. Russ has missed nine games in a row. Kawhi missed two games and left the Minnesota loss early with back spasms. Zoo has missed two games. So they've been totally out of rhythm rotation-wise. They're playing guys that will not play for them when their rotation is complete and healthy if it gets back to that point. But I'm at the point where as much as I would like to give this veteran team the benefit of the doubt, and part of me does, because that two-month sample, 35-game sample, was powerful as hell. And it's hard to get a rhythm when you're missing different guys every game. It's not the same guy. It's not like, all right, this guy's out for two months. We can replace him this way and lean into this identity. It's so today these two are out. Today these two are out. Tomorrow those two are out. You're, you were a clipper. 
<laughs> this franchise means something to you. How worried are you about them? Are you not? Are you dismissing this as just doldrums, injuries, or is 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 something meaningful happening here, both either in general or in terms of the New Orleans matchup specifically, which looks like a, lo- a very likely to happen in the first round? I want to answer both those questions, but I just want to start with how worried I am. I'm very worried. Like this is, I was at the Minnesota game where Kawhi, uh, sitting uh, in the press room, press row, excuse me, and and watching it. And when Kawhi steps out. This thing that worries me the most about them is just they're playing very apathetically, it looks like. And very, um, the game yesterday, a lot of times, it's like, where's the energy? Where's the juice? And at times when they had those kinds of problems in in that 35-game run that we're talking about, Russ would come in and change the energy. They don't have that. And they don't have a guy on the bench that's going to come in and change the energy. And and, uh, good or bad, might just be pure chaos, you know, whatnot, but create some sort of juice you don't I don't see them playing with a lot of juice and then I'm watching just every one of these games sloppy turnovers after sloppy turnovers lazy passes that get picked off you know and and not being on the same page and things like that like there's something that's just not connecting with these guys in a way where you just don't feel like they're as locked in as you would hope at this point and it's hard like look when I was with the Clippers under Vinny Del Negro, we had an entire month of December. We went undefeated. We killed it. We were going nuts. It was awesome. We 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 felt really good. Calendar changed. We lost our defensive intensity, and then we never really got it back all season. And I think that's the, the what I'm worried about with the Clippers. Was this 35-game run their peak, and now are they not going to be able to ramp up that intensity? And what scares me even more is I feel like they think they can just flip the switch and get that intensity back. But to be a flip the switch team, you have to have done it before. And yes, Kawhi's done it, but the rest of these guys haven't. And I think that worries me in a a, a large level. So when I watch these games, I want to see them more play. It's fine if they lose, but play forceful, play, uh, play aggressive in that way. We're watching it with Denver coming out of the all-star break. And, and, and they're one team. We could just be totally flip the switch. They can lose every game here on out to the playoffs. And I'll be like, don't care. Denver still nobody's got an answer for Jokic and when they want to go they go and that's what worries me with the Clippers and then to that matchup you were talking about that should really concern the Clippers if Zion can take Kawhi now the the advantage the Clippers are banking on was no team can guard Kawhi Paul George and James Harden Pelicans can if if Zion can take Kawhi because now you have Trey Murphy and Brandon Ingram and Herb Jones, all those guys to be able to deal with Paul George, with James Harden. Like, that's a concerning thing for them to keep an eye on. And and really, they're going to have to figure out how would they be able to attack uh, Zion if he's on Kawhi. What, what, what are they going to do? It, it, it creates a lot of problems for them. Well, and that's where the Harden missing that game, because they're, they're going to default to bring Zion into the pick and roll with James Harden. Because without Harden... They just don't have enough passing to make Zion move around the floor as much and make as many rotations as they would if they can at least trigger start possessions with, okay, this play is going to get the ball and the, and, and players moving. And that's what they've lost. I think it may have started maybe in not this specific game, maybe a couple games earlier that I don't remember, but that loss to the Lakers when they blew that gigantic lead and LeBron made a million threes was the first loss where I, a red flag came up for me that they're walking around on offense again. They're just going through the paces. And when they were humming, they weren't the most dynamic offensive team. These are deliberate offensive players for the most part by nature. There's no Steph Curry running around off picks on the Darren Terrence man's not deliberate. He's a, he's an engine. Russ right. is an engine. They, those guys have motors strapped to them, but these are deliberate guys, but they had found the right blend of, Okay, Harden pick and roll, drive the closeout, drive the next closeout, see where that leads us. Maybe Kawhi has a mismatch because of the rotations. Now we play mismatch ball. While we play mismatch ball, maybe there's a split screen over here. It's not the greatest, most dynamic offense, but there was a pop to it. The pop has not been there for a while now. And look, I think they can clean up the transition defense, which has been hideous, and be a a solid defensive team. That may be a, a switch flip that's just effort based and matchup based having not played basketball at a level near the NBA. I don't really know how a flow gets lost and 
gotten back. And that's it's the offensive flow, although their offense has been okay during their eight during this eight and ten stretch, they're eighth in offense. So it's not like they've fallen apart. The snap isn't there. And and also two other things. They can't get rebounds. And that's another area where they miss Russ. And when when Kawhi's off the floor, they're just small. They're 23rd in defensive rebounding for the season and 26th in this 18 game stretch. They can't get any rebounds right now. Yeah, and and, and that's a huge huge issue i mean i think oklahoma city for that all the time and it's it's a playoff problem for both of these teams it's, in a, that it's a matchup problem like you might get lucky and dodge the great offensive rebounding teams but you also might get unlucky and be like oh my god we drew this team right and just the size and everything that comes with it and it's they are it's funny it's they they feel small and at the same time it's you know they have long guys like paul george needs to be on the the boards a little harder they i mean they have tice on the bench they have uh Plumley, obviously Zubach, like that's their big th- their big man center rotation. But like they gotta get more rebounding from the wings. And you need honestly, I also think you need Terrence Mann to take more of that rebounding energy that Russ had and and really bring it. It's small, but that loss of Russ is a big one. I don't think we really discuss it enough when we look at them in that that guy does so much for you. And I'm not even a huge Russ fan. I, I I know what his limitations are on offense, but what he can kind of just bring the mentality and the energy and and crashing the glass and 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 get you an extra possession for an offensive rebound and things like that. Like it's so valuable, and they just don't have any way to recreate that. And I think that's a big issue for them. By the way, speaking of this New Orleans Clippers matchup, I, I feel like New Orleans is training the opposite way, where they have locked in that flow. And that just that feel that every really good team has. Um, not only that, I think there are players on this team who are eager to prove themselves on the biggest stages. This is a team that has not won a playoff series together. Zion has not played in a playoff game. I think they're hungry. And I think there's like a cycle going on with them where they're confident and they're hungry and they're winning and they're winning against good teams for the most part. Although they, actually their schedule has been soft, but like a couple of good wins against the Clippers, for instance. And it's starting to build on itself where they are they They're like, Oh, we're, we got something going here. We're feeling even better about ourselves. And if there's a moment, another moment I'll remember in that game. So when Paul George was open for three, yes. at top of the arc <laughs> and wide open rose up, Took his time. Like, I'm going to set my feet. I'm going to take my time. And Herb Jones came flying from 20 feet away, blocked it almost right when it got out of Paul George's hands and went the other way on a fast break. Antonio Daniels, who does an incredible job on the Pelicans broadcast, I I thought was going to jump onto the court and hug (laughs) hug Herb Jones. He was so excited. (laughs) It was a play that, and this is hyperbolic. I get it. It felt like a statement play, like a, we are here. We are going to be in your face. We're younger than you. We're more athletic than you. And we like this matchup. Let me take this shot and shove it down your throat. It was an unbelievable play if people have not seen it. It's just a great momentum one. It's just one that kind of just brings that sort of attitude. And it was in, I think it was the third quarter, right? Like when the uh, the Pelicans really kind of built out the a, a lead a little bit. I think that's one of those things where it's like, Everything you said is right on. And it's just like, now, next time Paul George gets it, he's going to rush the shot. <laughs> he's good enough to make it, but now he's not going to slow. He's not going to be patient about it. He's It's in his mind. And that's something now that they've planted, right? And I think, you know, maybe it's a small thing. Maybe it's a big thing. Who knows? But, like, I think that's going to be something that, hey, we're going to be aware of. And you have to be ready. If you're the Clippers and you're playing the Pelicans in the playoffs and you're putting your playoff tape together, you know, that needs to be a clip you show Paul going like, hey, man, can't be slow. This is this team has that energy and that juice. You can't be slow. Got to be ready. Uh, the Clippers are also a low foul team on defense. And as everyone around the league, and I hear from people on teams across the whole league, is trying to digest how the officiating has changed in the last however you want to, two months, one month, six weeks, eight weeks, two months, whatever. And they're all self-interested because their team's trying to win. Does it help us? Does it hurt them? Does it hurt our rival? And w- one facile way to do it is like if the Clippers are a low foul team, they teach not fouling, they're good at not fouling. Well, if everyone's going to be a low foul team, <laughs> right. fouls are going to be a call that loses a little bit of value. 
And I just want to read an excerpt from actually type this out and print it out. And Tom Ziller and his great newsletter printed out the same excerpt from what Monty McCutcheon, who's the director of whatever he is for the NBA. I can't remember anyone's titles. They're like nine words long said to me on my podcast last week when I called him and Joe Dumars, I said, can you guys come on and like tell people what's going on here? This is a, this is literally almost word for word. See if you can keep up with this Mo. <laughs> this is Monty McCutcheon in any year. And I'm going to read it slow because it's not easy to keep up with. In any year, there are points where we are not as consistent as we need to be. I most certainly in my role coach up what our rule book says. If a dribbler has a straight line path to the basket, they cannot be crowded off that pathway. The same is true for a defensive player's pathway. If you are both on parallel pathways, neither party is allowed to take someone off their pathway. There most certainly has been some coaching this year and teaching this year about making sure we remain consistent from Monday night to Tuesday night to Wednesday night. We had some work there that we had slipped in. And so we most certainly have been teaching what our rule book states is good basketball so that there is a balance for competition. Good competition isn't score-based. It's based on an equitable situation for offensive and defensive players to reasonably expect to be able to compete so that neither party is placed at a disadvantage. We most certainly have done that coaching this year. 30 seconds later, what I will say is much before February, we were within our work already, already recognizing the need for consistency in this area. We have absolutely worked on that consistency. I think that we've done a better job at it. So that's gobbledygook. That's that's bureaucratic gobbledygook. It's intentionally obfuscating from the league office. But if you actually translate that into plain language, he is saying it's all in there. We told the refs, you're messing up this call and giving offensive players the benefit of the doubt on drives to the rim where the defense is in position. You got to call it differently. What they're he's saying that he's just saying that in a block of text this long because he doesn't <laughs> want you to realize that he's saying the refs were missing this call. What they're pushing back on is we don't care about scoring totals, we care about fairness. So the idea that people were yelling about Lucas scoring 73 and Booker scoring 60 and Cat scoring 60, that's not why we did this. We were already doing it before. Offense is fine. And the other idea they're pushing back on is. This is Adam Silver putting his finger on the scale and saying, do this. I don't like it. Change it this way. Even though Joe Dumars in the same podcast told me the pendulum may have swung too far in the past to offenses. But that's Monty McCutcheon on the record in bureaucratic gobbledygook saying we told the refs over time, maybe before you guys um, think we did, that they were missing this call. Now, do I think there's a little bit of the lady doth protest too much going on here from the league office, probably having listened to it again. Um, because the bottom line is no matter when they started teaching or coaching or pathways and consistency and this and that starting two months ago, the game turned from game a to game B and the difference is stark. And I find it hard to believe that it just sort of randomly happened at that time that dramatically, but at least Monty came out and said, without slamming the refs, without saying it was too heavy-handed, that we've been coaching and teaching this play and kind of admitting that, yeah, midstream we told the refs because like we always do, we try to make it seem like we do it every year. It's just part of our ongoing, you know, best practices, to use an HR term, um, that they changed. But So that's that. Um, can I talk about the other team that I want to talk about from the West? Or do yes. you have any other Clippers thoughts? No, no. no. I, I'm very eager to talk about uh... – what you said about the other team, but before just real quick on the, my wish the NBA would just come out and just whether they did it or not, just say they did. Cause it's a good thing. <laughs> I think, I think the league, I think the league, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. And I think they need to be a little bit like, uh, I just watched a few good men the other day. And I think they need a little Colonel Jessup in them. You just, and, and, are you doing randomly watch the few, like I want to pop I love that. I, I love that movie. <laughs> if it's on and I just see it, it's there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm turning it on. It's the courtroom scene where, where Tom Cruise is grilling Colonel Jessup and yelling at him, you know, did you order the code red? And he finally breaks and he's like, you're damn right. I did like, like just, just say it. Like, it's a good thing. I think that's the, the, it's a good thing for the league. I think it's good that 
they whether they adjust they have they clearly tweaked something it's pretty obvious but and i'm okay with that they're, they're admitting they, that they did yeah um, and, but and I'm, the okay. manner the manner and the timing and the identity of the tweaker and the t whatever is is uh obfuscated i think intentionally so but don't we want adjustments hey this isn't really good let's tweak this and let's change this stuff up i've loved it i've been tweeting out stuff where like there's Plays where there's clear guys thinking it's a foul because they're used to it being a foul and the referees make a no call. And then the guy gets upset. Like, no, that's the basketball I want. And I'll tweet out those clips and tell them like, that's the right no call. There was one with Luca shooting a three. I think Gordon might've gotten him on the high five, but the contact was in the leg and it was Luca kicking out the leg. And Luca was upset for a possession and a half. I was like, no, that's the right call. That should be a no call. And I think that I just like what the leagues, I like what it is now. And hopefully we can kind of keep it going and hopefully it will pertain for a while. The other West team I wanted to talk about is now eighth. The Phoenix Suns are 39 and 29. Big three's back. They're two and three in their last five games, which sounds unremarkable, except the losses are to Boston twice and Milwaukee on the road without Giannis. Now you can just say Milwaukee hit 24 threes. That'll never happen again. Bobby Portis had an out-of-body experience for <laughs> a half of a game. And excuse it away if you want. And they did end up scoring 120-something points, whatever the Suns' final score was. So their offense mathematically had a good game. Their defense was nowhere to be found. I don't like the way this team looks. And the later it gets, the more worried I am that I'm just never going to like the way this team looks this season because they're not going to have time to get it right. Um, their next four games are Philly, Atlanta, and Spurs times two. They better get right soon because they're eighth. They're in the play-in, which I have said many times, if this team is in the play-in, it's a disaster. If they lose in the play-in, it's a colossal disaster. If they get out of the play-in and lose in the first round in some sort of weak, uh, you know, dull fashion, 4-2, 4-1, it's a disaster. They're looking at disaster right now, and they have the ability to fix it. They have the talent to fix it. They have the talent to get into the playoffs and beat Minnesota or Oklahoma City or whatever in the first round. Denver, I don't think so, but at least push Denver hard. That's how talented they are. But the talent, something about the talent is not translating. Tiebreaker-wise, Mo, they are 2-2 two and two against the Kings, but the Kings have the upper hand due to conference record. They have lost the season series to Dallas already. They have lost the season series to the Lakers already. They have won the season series against the Warriors already, so their tiebreaker-wise, they're not in great shape. I'm just going to be vague. I don't like how it looks. Do you disagree with me? And if you do, please shout and yell that you disagree. If you don't, zero in on something that the next three games that you watch of Phoenix, you're going to be looking at, like, I'd like to see that better. Uh, I agree with you. And I think the, the thing I want to see them better is, you know, I want to see KD more involved in the offense in a degree to a degree. Like he only got 10 shots against Milwaukee. I know that's an aberration. I know normally he's getting more shots and more looks and whatnot, but there are just too many possessions where I feel like there's no real, uh, true understanding of purpose. And it's not so much your turn, my turn, but it's more just these two guys go, this one stands in the corner. Like I want to see the three of them play together and Booker Beal and, KD, I want to see some three-man action between those guys. Like, that's crazy to cover. And then with how well Grayson Allen is shooting, he can space, and it makes it creates more opportunities and more difficult for the defense to really crash down because you got to watch out for one of the best shooters right now in the league and Allen. I think there's a lot of problems with their – it's funny. Their offense is potent, and they're scoring big numbers. And at the same time, I'm looking around going, like, what's the playbook? Like I, I wish there was a playbook and uh, I know each coach has packages for their guys and whatnot, but I just don't see besides a rand uh, besides a pin down to start the game, to bring KD to the elbow. And then again, at the start of the third quarter, I don't see a lot of stuff. I don't see anything where they don't run some Iverson action and things like that. I think there's a lot of stuff there. I think they're, they can do a lot more offensively and maybe part of the problem is Beal's been out for so long and they haven't had time to figure that out, but there's stuff. I think they they're leaving on the table to make them better offensively because their defense isn't going to be good. I don't think their defense is going to be good. I don't think they have much of a chance. There's a, a, a lot of miscommunications. This guy thinks they're switching. So, many. so it, many. It's, it's, it's at the point where I'm like, Nope, you just have to lean all the way into your offense 
because you're not going to be able to defend. And I think that's just their their issue. There's no way to fix it defensively in season. I just don't see them having anybody that can really be the guy where you feel like, okay, now they'll start to find a defensive way. So for me, lean into your offense, but that leads to you having to be more creative with your offense. And I'm not sure if Vogel has that. Yeah, I sound like Charles Barkley, but they're too small defensively. Mm. And they're the worst kind of too small where you can move them all out of the way. It's not like they're uh, Kyle Lowry small. You can move them out of the way. They're not a good rebounding team. Um, defensively, like they're they're actually 13th for the season. That's about as good as they can possibly get. And against good competition, I don't know if they can sustain that. I think that's is actually a success story for them. Average defense is a success story. Offensively, again, the numbers are fine. KD can't take 10 shots, but it's more that they seem to have lost the plot a little bit on like the whole reason they put these dudes together, which is the way they can amplify each other. Like, all right, I've got a, I've got Damian Lillard on me. There are multiple possessions in this Bucks game where Damian Lillard, who I think we all agree is not a good defender, <laughs> is on Brad Beal, and Brad Beal stands in the right corner. And if you put the spotlight on Brad Beal, and it's not... I'm not blaming Brad Beal. This just is. It could be Durant on the next five possessions. He stands in the corner. When I say stands, I mean hands, arms droop to his sides, not moving at all. For 15 consecutive seconds, Bradley Beal is me, but with the jump shot. Like, it's just he does literally nothing with Damian Lillard on him. And the whole point of pairing these guys together is to bring Brad Beal up and have him screen for Kevin Durant so Kevin Durant can have Damian Lillard on him or the Bucks get in rotation and this offense turns into something that's greater than the sum of its parts. The sum of its parts is really high and they showed you that against the Bucks when they came back and Beal had maybe his best game of the season or right. one of his best games, putting his head down, getting to the rim. But I also wonder the degree to which this lack of connection on offense, and by the way, they've been better earlier in the season at cooperating in actions. I do wonder how it's bleeding into their defense because their communication on defense and their coherence on defense has gotten worse. And that game, although they credit them, they, they, they fought and got back in the game, not in the manner that I would have liked to have seen. I would have liked to have seen them play so hard defensively. Like you've probably been with the team. You know when a team is just comes out and is like, we're going to be in a frenzy on defense for eight minutes. We know it's unsustainable. We can't play this hard for much longer than that, but we're going to be in a frenzy and just see what happens. It was more just like, eh, we're going to get some points and they're going to give us some points. But they made it a game. That's fine. I wonder how much the offense is bleeding into the defense and and what the, the sort of disconnectedness they must feel on offense if that's infecting their defense. Because yesterday was maybe their worst defensive performance of the whole season. I mean, they gave up 43 points in the second quarter, and I know Bobby Portis went completely nuclear. And just a side note, it is fun when he goes nuclear in Milwaukee. It's like a, a I'm not a wrestling guy, but just you just feel the crowd chanting Bobby. It's like a wrestling crowd, like WWE, and you have the the vibes with that stuff. But there's just too many times. Like there's an example. I I, I was watching rewatch the game this morning in the fourth quarter, and you know. Uh, KD and Aaron, uh, Eric Gordon mix up, mix up a switch and KD's literally just throwing his hands up and like, what are we doing? And then to your point, in terms of it bleeding offensively, a couple possessions later, Bradley Beal's driving down the lane. Uh, he has a double team on him and he kicks it back to Nurkic, but he has KD wide open on the wing. It's, and you know, KD does one of those things with his hands up. It's, it's a, there's a level of frustration you can feel building. And in, 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 I can really feel it with KD, but you can feel it within the team. And it's something that you begin to kind of worry about going going forward in the play, into the play-in and playoffs and, and how it kind of plays out. Because, again, there's not a lot of time. What, 15, 16 games left? I think this is their easiest stretch of games right here, these next four games that you lined up. I think the schedule gets increasingly tougher for them. Like, they got they got to really figure this thing out and – like you said, otherwise it's going to end up looking like a failure. I'm at the point where it's just starting more and more to feel like it's not going to happen this year. Like if it's going to happen, it's going to be next year. But I, I'll never count out Kevin Durant and Devin Booker completely. Um, to your to your point, their schedule is the second hardest in the West. Those projection systems I mentioned, 
have them as 80 to 85% likely to be in the play-in. They have like a 15% chance at, at six or higher. The other thing is, I can't tell if Frank Vogel thinks Yusuf Nurkic is essential to their team or an impediment to their team or both in the same game. I just know these KD at the five lineups, are, are they're just not going to work. And I say that knowing with KD and Booker on the floor and no big man on the floor, 126 offensive rating, which is ridiculous. <laughs> right. 123 defensive rating, which is almost equally ridiculous. You put Beal in, so the big three and no big man on the floor, 133 offensive rating, 126 defensive rating. So they're plus seven or plus three or plus five, however you want to calculate it. So they're quote unquote working. Their offense is obviously deadly. I just don't think that's actually workable because of the defensive figure and their defensive rebounding rate in those minutes is about 57%. So almost half the opponent misses, the opponent is getting back. I just don't think it's sustainable. And I just, I continue to say this. I Vogel is going to those lineups when they're behind and they just need points. Or it just feels to me like he's like, I'm not even sure this is a good idea. I just don't have any better ideas. Like, let me tr- let me try this thing. This is not like a calculated death lineup kind of thing. It's just like, all right, right I guess it's time to try this thing again. I mean, he's calling for answers, like you know, a uh, bowl bowl getting run at 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 center positions and 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 things like that. You know, uh, uh, Eubanks also trying to get some time. Like, it's it's they're just he's clawing for answers here at that point. And when it's it's hard with Nurkic, you know what. There, there's a situation where Nurkic can help, and I think his passing is really nice and helpful for the team, but you saw it in this game. Even with Lopez out there, they would just run pick and roll, and there was no way for him to get out to back to Lopez for the pops, no way to get out to Bobby Portis when he would pop out. It became a, a, a huge issue for them, and that's part of the reason why they got to pull him in the fourth quarter, and I just feel like I don't know. Again, like I just don't know how you answer it. This is a team to me that's kind of out of answers, and that's why... Just lean all the way into offense, you know. Defense be damned. I just hope you can you can just outscore those guys. I don't think you can win multiple playoff rounds that way. No. in in the West, I just don't. Uh, they've also the other thing they've tried with Nurkic in multiple games that I've mentioned before is all right. If they have a pick and pop center on the floor, because there's somewhere else we can put you. Isaac Okoro one game, Pat Beverly for a stretch yesterday against Milwaukee. The other thing that happened in that game was Chris Middleton came back and looked very good, and that is put a pin in it. Let's hope it continues. Let's see it with Giannis back. Because with those four dudes, Dame, Middleton, Giannis, and Lopez, they got a chance against anybody. And as rocky as this season has been on just about every possible level, those four guys are healthy. That's a scary team. I'm not picking them to beat Boston, but I would say they have the best chance in the East of beating Boston pending Nick's health and other things. But that, that could be a great team. Awesome. Chris Middleton, big fan. Wrote a big profile of him five or six years ago. Um, still love watching him play. Uh, the other thing that happened over the weekend that I wanted to talk about was <laughs> Victor Wembanyama was just like, I'll put up a casual 33, 15, 7, and 7 with assists and blocks game. Five steals short of the 5x5, five five, which again, he's going to break all the 5x5 five five records. I I saw the stat line. And I was like, all right, I'm watching an extra game. Like, I want to see I want to see this game. But I got I got to see it. And... Since December 27th, I will just continue to reiterate this. 23 points, 10 rebounds, 4 assists, 4 blocks, 1.5 steals, 49% shooting, 36% on threes. The Spurs are plus 23 in almost 1,000 minutes. The Spurs, who stink, are plus 23 since December 27th with Wembenyama on the floor. This guy is a star right now. Right now. And he's a superstar very, very soon. Like, maybe next year. Um, And... Every game, I don't know how much of this game you saw, Mo. Every game, there are just, again, five plays where I have to remind myself, like, that's not a normal thing. And it's getting more frequent. And it's getting scarier every game. Like, this guy is, it's really unbelievable the degree to which he has exceeded the hype, considering what the hype was. It's wild. It's wild. And and in the way of just every night, there's something it's you don't want to miss the Victor Webb and Yama games like because it's 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 something in terms of like he's just going to do something that you're just like no no 
seven four seven five shouldn't be able to move like that shouldn't be able to do any of that stuff like it doesn't make sense um you highlighted a clip and i was i, I went back and watched you know a, a lot of his minutes this morning the the clip you highlighted you're like hey pay attention to the, the third quarter drive on nick claxton he goes in between his legs once crossover in front in between his legs again turns nick claxton three different times and then finishes with his left like and a nice little layup, not like a dunk or anything forceful, just a nice little little uh lefty floater kind of deal. And I was just like, holy crap. Like you this know, is you know, unbelievable. You know what I thought of when I saw that play and the reason I wanted to talk about it today? So he he goes through and over Nick Claxton with a smooth, smooth set of dribble moves between the legs, crossovers, hits him with the shoulder to dislodge him somewhere around the foul line, and then goes through him the rest of the way. Doesn't beat him, like doesn't get around him. There's no pick and roll to get the defense in rotation. It's me against you starting 30 feet from the hoop, and he just takes him all the way, lefty layup off the glass. My first thought was, that's like Giannis if Giannis was 7'5". Like, that's what Giannis does. He's just like, I'm just going to go into you, spin, and be quicker, longer, bigger, and stronger than you, and finish at the rim. That was like a, oh my God. Uh, does that comparison make any sense to you? No, it it does, and I think it gets even scarier if he gets the Giannis body, right? Like, listen, he's he's only twenty. Like, he's going to put on weight. They're going to put him in a training program and regiment and all those things. I don't want him to get jacked, but if he gets kind of just muscular, in a way, like it's 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 scarier because then that little bump that doesn't really knock you that far back puts you back and 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 really kind of creates that space. And he did that all games act like when i went back and watched those clips i was like oh wait there's another drive there's another dr- there's another and i was just like this dude's unbelievable man yeah nick claxton sits back says look i'm i'm gonna dare you to shoot a jump shot even though you're shooting like pretty well from three lately which is another scary thing i'm gonna defend you this way i'm gonna dare you to eat up the space and you got to eat up the space and go through me and victor was like okay the other play i urge people to watch this it did not even make the NBA's highlight package. I watched the highlights from this game that the <laughs> NBA has like a three-minute highlight package of every game. Did not even make it. Two minutes left in overtime. By the way, the Nets were the other, the Nets were like Homer Simpson when he goes to box <laughs> Dredrick Tatum and his robe just says opponent on the back. It was the Nets. Sorry, I didn't mention the Nets. Um uh the Nets have a two-on-one, and it's like a textbook two-on-one. Mikhail Bridges is on the right wing dribbling the ball fast. On the left wing, diagonally from McHale Bridges and closer to the rim at, at the elbow, basically, McHale Bridges is behind the three-point line, is Dorian Finney-Smith. In between them is Victor Wembanyama. Dorian Finney-Smith is already behind Victor Wembanyama, already has the inside track. Picture-perfect bounce pass from McHale Bridges across the lane on the run to Dorian Finney-Smith. Victor Wembanyama is beat. He's toast. It's over. He's above the foul line, straddling the foul line when Dorian Finney-Smith catches the ball at the edge of the paint. There's no universe in which this is anything but a dunk or a layup. Victor Wembanyama pivots around, jumps, and blocks the shot as it's about two inches from going into the cylinder and still in the dude's hand. It did not make the NBA's highlight package. It didn't go into the stands. It was one of seven blocks. It is an absolutely remarkable basketball play that doesn't seem remarkable because there's no emphatic pin it off the backboard or no, I, the game just continues going on. I watched it and I was like, did I just see what I thought I saw? Did he cover that much? Am, am I overstating this? No, no. It's, it, it goes back to some of those passes I was talking about. It's a glitch in the matrix. It's It's one of those things where you're like, that's not supposed to happen like that's the weird like how is everybody just acting calm and normal about this like everybody should be going ballistic in this instance and, and your mind blown and we should talk about one of those blocks game saving block on Dennis Schroeder right like that's a huge huge play and it, 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 you're, it's just it's just we have to get used to this type of line from him you know, I did a I did a NBA Twitter uh, X spaces, excuse me, uh, uh, a few weeks ago, and we were talking about Victor Webanyama, and they combined his line from two nights in a row. And it was like fifty three points, twenty uh, something rebounds. You know, it, it just stuffed everywhere. And I'm like, guys, 
we're not far from that being a game line for him. Like we're not, it's just at one point, we're just going to get these absurd lines. We have to adjust ourselves for the fact that we're going to get this stuff. The five by five Zach might be just a regular thing for him. Might be something he gets six, seven times a year. Like it's, it, we have to adjust. And I mean, last time I was with you, he got it the next night. Yeah, we talked to you. That's right. It was me and you. I, I hope someone on X, like maybe the block went viral last night. I just don't know because I'm not engaged anymore on Twitter. Um, I hope people like put this block up. It's like an absolutely incredible play for the season, for the whole season, not December 27th, the entire season. This 15 and 53 team is plus 90 in 980 minutes that Trey Jones and Wembenyama have been on the floor. This 15 and 53 team is plus 172 in 709 minutes. That's winning a 48 minute game by 12 points with Trey Jones, Devin Vassell, and Wembenyama on the floor. And the Vassell Wemby two man game is starting to become a thing. Yes. Some not starting, it's a thing. And now they're adding layers to it. Like they'll run a little empty side pick and roll dribble handoff thing where he's hitting Wemby on lobs now. Mm -hmm. um, it's happening. Uh, Last thing I wanted to very quickly, I'm doing my one by one awards stuff. Um, and I said, let's do six man of the year. Let's give six I, man, let's give six man of the year a little love. I don't know you to, if you realize that has a special place in my heart because when Jamal Crawford won six man of the year when I was with the Clippers, he gave me a specific shout out in his speech afterwards. Did he really? He, yeah, it was he did it, thank all the coaches, all that stuff. And then he told a specific story and gave me a specific shout out in his speech. So for me, the sixth man of the year award. Wait, what was the story? You elaborate because I, I don't remember. It was one of those times where he was talking about how everybody works so hard at behind the scenes and whatnot. And it was Jamal and I used to be that's who I'd go rebound for after practice. And we would play a fun game of one on one where he would score a million points and I would just kind of be like, I'm never going to touch the ball. Um and one day after practice, I had just pulled an all nighter. Like, I think we had just arrived late and I was like, I'm at the practice facility is closer than my place. I'm just going to drive to the facility, work there for a few hours, take a nap and then be ready for practice. The next, uh, the, the next, we're getting ready for playoffs and things like that. So he sees me the next day and I'm dead. I'm half asleep. I'm a zombie of all this stuff. And, and, and he just looks at me and he's like, okay, I'm like, no, nah, like, you know, I'm, I'm fine. He's like, no, you okay. I'm like, oh, I, I didn't really sleep last night, you know, working and all of that stuff. And he gave me a nice little shout out in his speech. So for me, six man of the year always means something for me. Let's do the field quickly. Cause this is an award that is, isn't quite one of the headliners, but it's always fun. Uh, I'm going to, so I have, I think I have like a clear top. The ballot is three spots. I don't have an official ballot this year, but I'm going to write my column anyway. Um, and the ballot's got three. I think it's going to be three of these four for me, but let me start by saying, here are some names that are either not eligible or going to not be likely to not be eligible because the rule is <clears throat> you can't start more games than you come off the bench. Once those lines cross like that, you're out. Also, there's no 65 game limit for this rule. You don't have to play 65 oh, games. I didn't That's know that. in the CBA. I double checked with the, the union and the league. Like, there's no the 65 thing doesn't apply here. Okay, unlikely not or unlikely to be eligible. Josh Hart, Isaiah Hartenstein, Cam Thomas, Grant Williams. Although that could flip depending on your taste in Grant Williams. I'm just I like to say guys' names: Aaron Neesmith, Andrew Nebhart, Kelly Oubre, Gary Trent Jr., DeAndre Hunter, Rui Hachimura, Pajemski, Keontae George. Trey Jones and Io DeSumnu are all either started too many games or will have started too many games. Um, now I'm going to give my very long honorable mention. You ready? Yeah, go for it. And if there's anything, if there's one word you want to say about any of these guys, go ahead. So my congratulations, you're not going to be on the ballot, but you did nice things this year. Isaac Okoro. Yeah. Trey Murphy the third. who if he keeps playing like this, this is just a minutes thing for him. Yes. This is just the games and minutes. He's played 42 games. If he keeps playing like this, I might say, damn the torpedoes. Maybe it's just Trey Murphy the third. He 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 deserves it the way they're playing and whatnot. I think there's there's definite possibility right there. Chris Paul, Jordan Clarkson is shooting 29% on threes. He is averaging 17 a game. Karis Levert. 32% on threes, 48% on twos. Not good enough to crack my top four. It's passed it very well. Chime in anytime you want if there any yeah. of these people are passion yeah. projects for you. <laughs> Paul Anthony, Mo Wagner, 
I just got to always support him, Mo. Fair point. <laughs> Caleb Martin, uh, because I think he's the second best candidate on his team. Oh, Duncan think- Robinson. Duncan Robinson is also on the list of people who will likely not be eligible. Um, I, I I think the thing with Caleb Martin that probably will hurt him is a lot of times this does go to guys who score. And I think what he brings to the heat defensively is really important that sometimes gets missed in this award. Obi Toppin, Ben Matherin, Patrick Beverly, Andre Drummond, Onyeka Kongwu. Just congratulations on nice seasons. Isaiah Joe, who might be one of the most important bench players, but isn't quite prolific a month. You're, uh, enough. You're you're nodding. I, I I I'm at the point where I want him to start. Like I just think it's Ooh. it's. I just think I'd start him over Giddy. I think that's the first playoff. If if they're in a situation and they need to make a playoff adjustment, I think that'll be one of the first ones. And that's something we saw when they played the Clippers halftime. They started him over Giddy, and I, and and coincidentally, on with you again the next day. And we, it, I thought like that might be something that stays. I think he should start. Now we're getting into some deeper. I just like these guys. I don't want to say their names. Territory. <laughs> Corey Kispert. Peyton Watson, Nikhil Alexander Walker, Russell Westbrook, yeah. Larry Nance Jr., Eric Gordon, Royce O'Neal. Now my low minutes, but I just like them, keep an eye on them. They're not candidates, but they are coming off the bench. Walker Kessler, Amen Thompson, currently starting for the Rockets, but watch out. This the, oh, man, I'm so excited, and I actually love him being teamed with Ime. I think Ime is going to be able to do so many amazing things for him to in his career, just kind of developing him. And not nearly enough minutes. Jonathan Isaac is, yes. is up to like 35% on threes. He's getting up to back up to like 20 minutes in some of these games. This, if it's ever going to like happen, it might be kind of happening now. I, I don't know what you see from him, but I love when they put him at center or bank at center, depending on how you slice it. I like when they go ginormous and put Franz, Paolo, Isaac, and Carter all on the floor. I've said before on that I think per minute he's the best defensive player in the NBA. Uh, what have you seen from him? No, I think that's a. I think when when you say that, I continue to nod my head when I'm listening to the pod. Like I, I, I don't think it's close. I mean, we've been robbed by it with injuries in terms of seeing. You know, he could have easily been a defensive player of the year type guy over the years. And I think the thing that's more interesting about it is you were talking about frenzy defensive lineups. Like, Hey, we're going to play just unbelievable defense for eight minutes or whatever. The moment he's on the floor, that's that time for Orlando. We're playing lockdown defense guaranteed when he's on the floor for however long he's on that stretch. Uh, and uh, Trey Lyles, who's just gives the Kings a little bit of a mean streak, but is hurt right now. They miss him or has been hurt recently. So I've got nine names left and I'm pretty confident who my top four would be. Do you, where do you want to go? I now give the floor to you. Do you just, do you just want to say who your top three would be or top five or what do you want to do? Uh, I have my top three. Let me just run through quick with my top three. Um, I have Bobby Portis at three. I think, and, and you know, I think a lot of it, just the juice again, he brings it a lot of juice off the bench and really kind of bring some, some fire and, and, and real just different energy vibe. If they need it for the bucks, I have Malik monk at two. And I think again, I loved his, I think he's improved as a playmaker and making plays off the bounce and things like that, where I think it's just, again, watching that game grow even more and more. I think it's very deserved. And I'm going Norman Powell as my sixth man. I think, you know, uh, he's he does come in and it's when he subs in for one of those big three guys, they don't drop off that much offensively. And I think maybe more in that 35 game stretch. I think now, again, we know they're struggling, but I think the way he plays, he adds another element for them. You have to account for him defensively. And he's a guy I pretty confident he's going to be playing clutch crunch time minutes for them in the playoffs. And I think that's one of the more important things for the the six man of the year award type guys. This is a guy that's not just going to be sitting when we come to end of game situations. He's going to be involved. So here were my top four. I mentioned I had four guys that I like a hair better than the rest. And they don't include Bobby Portis, who's in my next, who's like fifth or sixth, but I don't really, I mean, it's all fungible at right. this level. I think if I had a vote right now, and it listeners should just assume these votes are not final, there are 18 games or 15 games left, I think I would vote for Malik Monk. Um, 
16 a game. He's going to get to 2,000 minutes, 37% on threes. His playmaking, he's essentially their backup point guard. Yeah. And sometimes co-point guard, I guess they have three point guards on the floor when it's Sabonis, him, and Fox on the floor at the same time. His playmaking feels more essential to his team and to a good team specifically, which is going to separate him from one of my other Final Four, than I think anybody else, anybody else's individual discrete skill, including Norman Powell's shooting, mm-hmm. which is, I'd probably vote him second, 44% on threes, high volume, snap release, 54% on twos, downhill drives, they don't miss a beat with him on the floor. Those are my top two. I think I would lean Monk. I might have Bogdan Bogdanovich number three. 16 a game, three assists, three rebounds, 37% shooting, shoots a million threes. The Hawks are plus three per 100 possessions with Bogey on the floor and minus nine without him. The fourth guy on my tier one is Nas Reed. 13 points, five boards, 41% shooting from three. 55% shooting from two. And I think we'll make a push now without Towns as his minutes and responsibility grows. Those are my those are my tier one. Tier two is Bobby Portis, Tim Hardaway Jr., 16 a game, kind of slumped in the middle of the season. I just don't think he's been quite as good as these guys. Jaime Hawkins Jr., down to 32% on three. He's very good. Love Jaime Hawkins. He, he Jr. went to a stupid college. That's not very nice. I know it's pers- it's personal yes. for you. Yes. Someone aggregate this and say potential NBA awards voter disqualifies <laughs> UCLA alone. Um, for some reason, and I actually don't disagree with it, Keldon Johnson gets no love in this discussion. 16 points, five rebounds a game, 45% shooting, 35% on threes, 53% on twos. It doesn't feel like that. Like I, there have not been a lot of games this year. Where I'm like, man, Keldon Johnson like changed that game, impacted that game. The numbers are good though. What do you? I can tell you have thoughts. It's it's kind of a little bit like empty calories at times, you know. And you feel like, and and part of it is the team is bad. Like let's just be honest. And it's and it's hard in that sense, you know. And like, look, McDonavich is on a bad team, but also that team's still possibly in the playing tournament. We're talking about a team that's like bottom third of the NBA to the point where it's pretty some nights unwatchable. And I think there's an element to where I think sometimes I get frustrated with it too. Sometimes I'm like, just, just pass the ball. Like this isn't, you're, you're not the guy here. And I think that's kind of what dings him is. It's not so much in the system. Sometimes it's also one of those things where one of the reasons you don't feel it is okay. You were the number one option a couple of years ago, average 20 something a game. Got a deal that I think is a fair contract. I heard it got it got picked in the worst contracts draft <laughs> podcast on uh on the Bill Simmons podcast. Uh, you know, they're not that many bad contracts anymore. So whatever. I he now lives in a world where it's like, all right, this isn't your world anymore. You're 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 coming off the bench. Like, so right. you're whatever the four, whatever best player on the team. You're not one, you're not two. Not a great three-point shooter, not a great playmaker, not a great defender. So, like, what are you bringing to the table that amplifies the best guys? Like, Devin Vassell, who's a starter, I can, like, I can see how he amplifies the best guy. So, I think that's part of it. Portis, I mentioned. And this, just kind of in a tier of his own where I'm just like, I like this guy. Kind of like late career, kind of big man Andre Iguodala on the Warriors, but not maybe not as essential, but kind of essential. Just shout out Al Horford. Eight points, yeah. six and a half rebounds. Shooting 40% from three, 64% on twos. If someone really wanted to make a like a just a really strong, adamant case for Al Horford to be like number two on their six man of the year ballot, I'd be, you know what? Have fun. Put Al Horford there. I don't care. That's my have, that's but right now I'm going Malik Monk. Yeah, and I think Monk and and Pal, I think it's just a hair close. Like you could I love your reasonings for Monk in that sense. And he also qualifies in my same mindset of like he's gonna be playing end of games. And uh, for the Kings. And I think that matters as well. So I think it's just, it's easy one way or the other with both of those guys. Uh, Mo Tequil, what are we going to see from you this week? I read your X's and Mo's last week, last Friday it came out, I believe. Uh, what yes. are we going to see this week? What should you be looking for? Uh, this week, I'm actually going to be doing some Twitch streams. I'm going to break down some games uh, on Twitch, uh, kind of running through the end of games. If you don't catch them live, 
you can watch it video on demand. Uh, going to have some fun with, with that stuff. So I think that's the main thing to keep an eye out for. If you want to know about basketball, follow everything this guy says and does and writes and twi twitches and and <laughs> uh, says and speaks into the microphones and all that. Mo Dekeel, thank you for spending some time with us. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in Los Angeles. Maybe in a couple of weeks, maybe we'll be at the same game again. Maybe we can grab a beverage after or something. That, that would be great. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having me.